بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم مبارك على عبده ورسوله نبينا وإمامنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد chapter 55 النبي may Allah have mercy upon him says باب فضل الزهد في الدنيا والحث على التقلل منها وفضل الفقر the excellence and superiority of zuhd renunciation Divorcing, abstaining, the superiority of abstinence from overindulgence in the worldly life. Indulgence in the worldly life. Asceticism, a person being a minimalist, a person taking as, as little as possible from this hayat dunya. The superiority of zuhud in this world. And the encouragement to take as little as one possibly can manage. Last but not least, wa fadl al fakri, and the excellence of poverty. The excellence of poverty. Each of these three points or these three pieces of the uh, title, the chapter title, the chapter heading, uh, deserves uh, its own lecture in itself, its own talk, its own book. Zuhd. What is zuhd? What isn't zuhd? The excellence of zuhud, the superiority of zuhud, the necessity of zuhud, the benefits upon one's spirit, upon one's mind, mental health and well-being, and upon one's physical health, your body. Zuhd will protect you from, inshallah, diabetes and cancer and ulcers and so many other diseases and illnesses, obesity, and the list goes on. Now, Financial well-being, saving money, managing money, economizing, so on and so on and so forth. All of the benefits that you get from zuhd. And the different misunderstandings and misconceptions that so many people have about zuhd. The obligatory zuhd versus the subrogatory zuhd. Uh, the, the zuhd which is a virtue. And every Muslim isn't required to do. And the levels of the zuhd, the people of zuhd. All right? Right, and itself is a discussion. People blaming their financial woes and saying, I'm practicing zuhud. Or a person's dead. Or it's so many different issues here. So many different issues. Where, do, where would you like to start with regards to discussing zuhud? Okay. What the Salaf of Salih said zuhud is. A person not despairing, not feeling sadness upon that which he loses out in this world. And a person not feeling happy. And overjoyful, overjoy, or yani, a person being ecstatic, all right, over what he does have, which leads to negligence, heedlessness, pride, arrogance, conceit, scorn, forgetting the poor, forgetting the weak, forgetting the needy, etc. Now, um, taqallul, obviously, we live in a world which so many different old and ancient. Practices are now becoming hip and trendy and cool and fashionable. Eating good, vegetarianism, veganism, drinking green tea, Japanese tea, matcha tea. That's the cool hip thing, right? And people have been drinking matcha tea for how many years, right? How many centuries, right? And people being uh, minimalists. It's not strange. It isn't strange. Go on YouTube, find someone. Showing all of their possessions in one room. I have one pair of shoes. I have a spoon. I have a bowl. I have a set of chopsticks. Uh, one pair of jeans, a t-shirt, socks, underwear, and that's it. Or a person lives in a small, tiny house. Or small, tiny, they stay in a small, tiny hotel. Right? And uh, minimalism being a, a, a modern novelty or nuance. Many people think and feel when it's very old, practiced by many people of different faiths and of different religions. And of course, there's a level of minimalism that the Muslim is to be upon. And of course, there are other levels of taqallul, of minimalism, that a Muslim doesn't have to be upon. But if he is upon, then alhamdulillah for that. And of course, there are different people in different situations that can't necessarily do that. The leader, how the leader is to present himself in front of the people. With regards to your dress code. And the list goes on and on and on. Quality. The Muslims having a strong army. Doesn't necessarily mean they have the Muslims have to be poor and hungry and starving. 
Okay? And there are many different examples and manifestations of a taqallul. Fakr, poverty. Question is, is poverty itself a virtue? Is it a virtue of being poor? Or instead, is there a virtue in being patient upon poverty? And not begging, and not doing haram, and not selling one's soul, and selling one's deen to, to remove him or herself from poverty. That in itself is a question. Is the poverty itself the ibadah? Or is the poverty the strike, the thing which ignites the engine? Hmm? Causing uh, the vehicle to be propelled. Naam? So that's very interesting in itself. What's important is Muslims who are poor and Muslims who are patient upon poverty and they don't perform haram acts or disliked acts because of poverty. Well, for sure, that is a tremendous virtue. And we've read and studied many times before we've discussed the scholars of Islam differing on the issue. Who is better? al ghani al shakir the thankful, wealthy man, Am al faqir al sabir, or the patient, poor man, who is more virtuous, who is closer to Allah. And the scholars, they have a, a very long, voluminous, uh, momentous discussion concerning which of the two is better. What's important is, is that there's a virtue in being upon poverty and being patient upon that poverty. And of course, we know that poverty is a major, major world problem. And there have been countless movements, governments, regimes, dynasties, rebellions, uprisings with regards to poverty and with regards to exploitation, capitalism, socialism, communism, revolts, right? Monarchies. And obviously, when we talk about the modern Western world, and the various founders and makers of this modern Western world and the main players and contributors, the Romans, the Greeks, or the Greek, the Persians, and many people from other ethnicities as well. Mesoamerica, Central America, South America, the Caribbean, West Africans, Mansa Musa, hmm? The different Western European nations, Spain, Portugal, Germany, Italy, England, uh, the Dutch, the Danes, etc., 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 right? The Vikings, and the list goes on. The Chinese, and the list goes on and on. But the concept of Spartacus, right? And Spartacus being the inspiration to so many different rebellions and movements. Jewish and non-Jewish peasant rebellions against their overlords who have, oppre have oppressed them and exploited them and not just taking their rights, but actually changing the system, inverting the dynamic, the pyramid, not just I want my haq and you, you can't oppress me anymore, but now the people on the bottom are in charge and the list goes on, all right? We talk about uh, many different wars the Middle East, Iraq, right? Uh, so many different paradigms that we can take just from the concept of poverty and the different rebellions and the main wars between, you know, the the the, the, the capitalists and the socialists. Mm -hmm. And what does Islam say about poverty and about poor people and the reward of poor people? And what, is, what does Islam teach us about capitalism or exploitation? And the list goes on and on and on. It's a very long discussion. What's important is poverty has its place in the deen. That's the moral of the story. And if the Muslim is patient upon the qadr of Allah, and if he's pleased with it, which is an even higher level, and he thanks Allah for it, which is an even higher level, and he doesn't go towards the haram, then of course there's a tremendous status in front of Allah, the sublime and the exalted. And many people say that's the best thing to be, someone who's poor and someone who's patient. And there are many different Islamic denominations uh, different mystic groups that associate and attribute themselves with poverty. Tayyib, khayran, inshaAllah ta'ala. 
many ayat. And obviously, this is a very long chapter showing you how important this discussion is. No, he quotes the first ayah. قال الله تعالى إنما مثل الحياة الدنيا كما إن أنزلناه من السماء فاختلط به نبات الأرض مما يأكل الناس والأنعام حتى إذا أخذت الأرض زخرفها وزينت وظن أهلها أنهم قادرون عليها أتاها أمرنا ليلا أو نهارا فجعلناها حصيدا كأن لم تغن بالأمس كذلك نفصل الآيات لقوم يتفكرون First ayah is from uh, Surah Yunus Allah says the similitude, the parable, the likeness of this world is nothing more than the similitude or the likeness of water, of rain that we have sent down from the clouds. This rainwater mixes with the crops, the herbs, the vegetation, right? The seeds, the soil, the grain, the earth, nabatul art, right? From that which the people eat along with their animals. Agriculture, the importance of agriculture in the life of everyone. Even living in the middle of the concrete jungle, you think that you're far away from the farm and plants and all of that nature, soft stuff, everything that you're eating, even the stuff that comes from the laboratory is originally based off of the agriculture. From that which the people eat and that which the animals eat. Until when the earth... It reaches its peak and pinnacle of beauty. Its peak and its pinnacle of beauty. The spring. All of those lovely flowers and trees and blossoms. Hmm? Earth is just gorgeous. And the people of the earth, they think that they're in control. They think that they are the powerful. They think that they're running the show. Ataha amruha. Oh, Allah says, Ataha amruna. He says that our affair comes upon this earth. Fajalaha hasida. And all of these different trees die, these plants die, they wither, they fall down, they're cut down, they go away, they vanish. Right? The changing of the seasons. You look at the wind, the rain, the snow, the ice, the hell, the extreme heat, the forest fires. Hmm? These things that cause destruction and ruin. As if it didn't even exist. As if it was just like, you know, as if it wasn't as beautiful as, as yesterday. Right? Allah says, thus, do we explain the signs for people who think? And there's not much to say. It's self-explanatory. And it's extremely profound. If you just think about what this verse is teaching us and telling us never to get too attached to this hayat dunya And do not be fooled and tricked, duped and deceived by its beauty. For indeed it shall all fade. It will go away. It's not going to last forever. Next ayah, we call it Ta'ala, we'll do it with a method and hayat dunya, kama in and the lahum in a semi for Tarata behind a battle art, Fasaba Hashim and Tadru Riah, we can allow Ala Kulisha in Mokotadira, Al Malu will banoon as in a Turhayat dunya, while Bakiat Sali had to Hirun in the Rabbi Kathawaba or Hirun Amala. Next ayah from Surah Kaf, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, he says, and make an example for them, O Muhammad. The life of this world, once again, Allah says, Kama'an is like water, it's like rain that we have sent down from above, from the heavens, from the clouds. And it mixes with the earth, the soil, the mud, all right, the seeds, the grains, the plants. All right, and these different plants, tall, strong, beautiful. Fragrant, uh, 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 fragrant, aromatic. They become broken up, cut down. They become withered. They die. They go away. Okay, the wind cuts them down, mows them down. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is omnipotent. He's al, he's al muqtadir, the most powerful, 
Subhanahu wa ta'ala. The ever omnipotent. The all omnipotent. Uh, Allah says in the next ayah, Indeed, children and wealth are the beauty or the beauties of this world. And the righteous deeds that will remain. These deeds that are with Allah, known by Allah, recorded by Allah. Those are the things that, that are better, right? For a person to have a reward and final destination, final living place, final dwelling place, Allah must die. وقال تعالى واعلموا أنما الحياة الدنيا لعب ولهو وزينة وتفاخر بينكم وتكاثر في الأموال والأولاد كمثل غيث أعجب الكفار نباته ثم يهيج فتراه مصفرا ثم يكون حطاما وفي الآخرة عذاب شديد ومغفرة من الله ومغفرة من الله ورضوان وما الحياة الدنيا إلا متاع الغرور And then in no way he quotes many many ayat or summarizes them uh, he says, There are many, many verses here that talk about the phenomenon, the phenomenon or the phenomena of this world, its beauty, how it smells so good, feels so good, looks so good, tastes so good, right? And how most people get caught up, they get stuck. They become worshippers of the beauty. They become worshippers of the flowers. And they forget that there was a time which the flower didn't sprout. And there's a time which that flower will wither and will start to stink. It'll die. Thus, the woman's beautiful face, her soft, tender face, will wrinkle and sag. Thus, the man's strong biceps, his muscles, his back, the strength of youth. The man is so strong and powerful. He can lift this. He can work. He can do all of these things. The athlete, right? This champion athlete is so fast, so graceful, right? A time will come in which he will slow down. A time will come in which he won't be able to evade that tackler. And he'll get hit and hurt badly. And he'll limp. And he'll have permanent injuries. This man that you see sitting in this chair with the, with the sagging skin and the freckles and the falling, his hair is falling out. His teeth have fallen from his mouth. Dentures. He's wearing a diaper. Hmm? In a wheelchair. With a walker. With a cane. Back bent over. At one point in time, that was a big, strong man. Oppressing people. Violating people. Full of himself. Arrogant. Tyrannical. He thought he would never, ever get old. He would never die. He wouldn't, you know? And look now. Look at him now. People, they forget this. So Allah Azza wa Jalla, he tells us that this world is a game it's a place of amusement, of laughing and joking and jesting and enjoying your desires, eating and drinking, and that's it. And, and being negligent and, and heedless from the reality of death. And that the world will not last forever, and the hereafter will last forever. Allah must on. Khayran, inshaAllah. Wa amal ahadithu, fa akthiru man an tuhsar, fa nunabih bi tarafin minha ala ma siwa. As far as the hadith regarding this reality, then there are more than can be counted. Ample, limitless. And we will mention some of them, which will show to you and explain to you the rest. How to understand the rest, how to benefit from the rest. As we say from one thing, we learn 10,000 things. That's the principle, right? The first hadith, he says... عن عمرو بن عوف الانصاري رضي الله عنه أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بعث أبا عبيدة بن الجراح رضي الله عنه إلى البحرين يأتي بجزيتها فقدم بمال من البحرين فسمعت الانصار بقدوم أبي عبيدة فوافوا صلاة الفجر مع رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم فلما صلى رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم انصرف فتعرضوا له فتبسم رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم حين رآهم ثم قال أظنكم سمعتم أن أبا عبيدة قدم بشيء من البحرين فقالوا أجل يا رسول الله فقال أبشروا وأملوا ما يسركم فوالله ما الفقر أخشى عليكم ولكن أخشى أن تبسط الدنيا عليكم كما بسطت على من كان قبلكم فتنافسوها كما تنافسوها فتهلككم كما أهلكتهم متفق عليه Narrated عمر بن عوف الانصاري رضي الله 
then one day the Messenger of Allah he sent Abu Ubaidah ibn al-Jarrah to Bahrain um, to collect its jizya, the taxes from those dhimmis there. And obviously the word Bahrain in the Ahadith doesn't mean just the modern day country today, Bahrain. But it is anything on that coast, the coast with regards to um, Arabia, Indian Ocean, that area, you know, the Persian Gulf, so on and so forth. Now, well, I'll tell Adam. Uh, he says that they were to go to Bahrain. Uh, he was to go to Bahrain and bring back the jizya, the head tax or the poll tax. So he returned. And the Ansar, they heard the news that Abu Ubaidah was returning with all of this wealth. Um, and they made Salat al-Fajr with the Messenger of Allah, And when the Messenger of Allah, finished Salat al-Fajr, uh, he turned around, فَتَعَرَضُوا لَهُ Alright, he, he was done, he was ready to get up, move about, فَتَعَرَضُوا لَهُ And they, they looked towards him, you know, like, like, like we would say, like, you know, like, what's up, like, we both know, the money is here, you know, Bismillah, <laughs> hook us up, right, hook us up, right, you know, what I want, I know what's there, it, you know, it's the wealth, you know, hook us up. فَتَبَسَّمَ And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he smiled. He smiled when he saw them in his state. And he said, I believe that you've heard of Abu Ubaidah's arrival with the money. It's just not the case. Of course it is, O Messenger of Allah. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, أَبْشِرُوا وَمِلُّوا مَا يسركم. He said, be happy. Smile. Don't worry. Don't worry. Poverty isn't the thing that I'm afraid of for you. I'm not afraid that you'll be poor and needy. However, I'm afraid that the worldly life will be given to you. The worldly life will be presented to you. I'm afraid that the hayat dunya will be laid out in front of you. As it was laid out in front of those who came before you. And you would compete with each other, fight with each other. Claw, scratch, bite and kick with each other for dominance and control. As the previous nations did. And it will ruin and destroy you. As it ruined and destroyed the previous nations. Hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. Beyond self-explanatory. If the worldly life and chasing it doesn't destroy your worldly well-being. It will destroy your moral well-being. Your spiritual well-being. As we said, the mental well-being. You'll be depressed 24-7. Worrying about money. Worrying about bills, worrying about lawsuits, right? Allah must die. Greed. Naam? Tell you, moving forward. Why Nabi Sayyidina al Khudri radi al anhu kala jalasa Rasulullah sallam ala al minbar, wa jalasna hawlahu, fa kala inna mama, oh inna mama akha, inna mama akha fa alaykum min badi, ma yufta alaykum min zahra til dunya, wa zinatiha, mutafakun alay. Abu Sayyid al Khudri radiallahu anhu narrated one day the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam sat upon the minbar, we sat beside him, around him, and he said, "From that which I fear upon you, after my demise, after I leave you, is the beauty, and the the glamour, the glitter, right? The glitter, the glamour, the gold, the zina, the beauty of this world will be given to you." And this hadith is in Bukhari and Muslim. وَعَنْهُ أَنَّ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ قَالَ إِنَّ الدُّنْيَا حُلْبَةٌ خَدِرَةٌ وَإِنَّ اللَّهِ تَعَلَى مُسْتَخْلِفُكُمْ فِيهَا فَيَنْظُرُوا كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ فَاتَّقُوا الدُّنْيَا وَاتَّقُوا النِّسَاءِ رَهُ مُسْلِمْ Abu Sayyid al-Khudri رضي الله عنه also narrated that the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said Indeed the life of this world is sweet and green And indeed Allah Azza wa Jal will give you succession therein and he will look and see at how you behave when it's your turn. So fear this world and fear women. The hadith is in Muslim. Scholars of Islam say that the dunya is sweet in taste and green meaning pleasing to the eyes. So it's a, a pincer move. You're being attacked from two, two, two angles. Right? 
I just think about the, the, a fine dining experience, right? It's much more than just food, right? From the time in which you pull up to the restaurant, there's valet parking. Or if you're not valet parking, you park yourself in a nice parking garage. From the moment you walk into the restaurant, the lights, how dim they are, the music, the sound of the people, of the glasses, of the china, the candles on the table, the flowers, right? The napkins, the spoons, they automatically bring you soup and salad and breadsticks or muff or, or biscuits, etc., etc., etc. Everything is an experience. How you look, the, the sight of the restaurant, the sound of the restaurant, the taste of the food, of course, the smell of the food, of course, the texture, the feeling of the tablecloth. There's no doubt about that. So they are attacking all of your senses, much more than just you eating. That's the Hayat dunya Everything is going to be attractive. The smell, the taste, the feel, everything from the Hayat dunya is pleasing and pleasant. So beware of this worldly life and of course beware of women. Beware of becoming a slave of your sexual desires. Beware of becoming a slave of a woman and the lusting for women and chasing of women. Next hadith, and of course from this hadith we look at how Allah will give the people their turns. Once again, we talk about capitalism, socialism, communism, these different isms and movements and rebellions. A person starts off as being poor, a, pa- a, 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 a pauper, a peasant, farmer. But when they rise to power, what do they do? How do they behave? Hmm? You start behaving arrogant, arrogantly. You start looking down upon people. You start mistreating people. You go after your political enemies. How hypocritical is that now? You said that the ruler had to go. The czar. Or the khan. Or the sultan. Right? Or the shah. Huh? Or the president. Etc. And then when you get rid of them, you turn into the monster that you swore to destroy. He's locking up his political opponents, torturing them, and now you do the exact same. Palestine, Gaza, West Bank. People go around saying, well, the Jews had nowhere to go. They were being persecuted in Sobibor and Dachau, Auschwitz, you know, in these concentration camps. The Nazis were using their skin to make lampshades. They were doing experiments with them. They were killing people, shooting people, arresting people, torturing people, etc., etc., etc. Forcing all of the Jews to go into the ghettos of Poland. And the list goes on. Working them to death, etc., etc. Taking all their property, extorting them, exploiting them, taking everything from them. Robbing and stealing, looting. Right? So the Jews, they had nowhere to go but Palestine, which was their original homeland. God promised them the land. They have returned, etc., 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 etc. All right, no problem. Let's say all of that's true. And let's say that, you know, the Jews have to go to Palestine. Why didn't they go to Europe? How stupid is that? And people don't ask the important questions. Okay, the Holocaust is over. Hitler and the evil devil Nazis are dead and they're all gone. Give them land, properties, and territories in their original countries. Poland, Germany, Russia, Ukraine, Slovakia, Romania... Czechoslovakia, except why are they going to the Middle East? How stupid is that? How, how do, that makes no sense. Send them to America. How many states are there in America? How much open land is there in America? Why, why, why are you kicking them out of Europe? Why do they have to go? And most importantly, those people in Palestine, what did they have to do with the Holocaust and Nazis? Why are they? Why? Why do they have to? Why am I paying your tab at the restaurant? Cause you ordered all of this food and ate all of this stuff. Why am I paying your tab? That that's your stuff, not mine. That's not my problem. But for argument's sake, that's all true. No problem. Cool. Well, how do the Israelis and the Zionists? How do they act and behave now in Palestine? How do they treat the Palestinians? Do they kill them? Do they beat them? Or do they rape their women? Did they shoot their goats? Did they put them in, in prisons, detain them, torture them, abuse them, starve them to death, 
cut off their water, cut off their electricity, poison their water sources, steal from their banks, take their money, take their wealth, loot their homes, take their furniture and paintings, take all of the valuables and put them in the Jewish universities and Tel Aviv and so on and so forth. It's your turn now. You're the ruler. You're the leader. You're in charge. And you behave just as evil, if not worse than the Nazis. And the list goes on and on and on. If you think about it, these different revolutions, people, they claim that this person is so unjust, so evil, so vile. But when they sit on the throne, what do they do and how do they become? So it's extremely paradoxical, the human psyche. And the hadith clearly states that Allah Azza wa Jal is mustakhlifukum. He will make you the khulafa. He will make you the khalifa. It states this in the Quran as well. You will become the leaders, the successors. Now it's your turn. It's your turn to go and to grab the man who raped that poor village girl. Oh, it's going to cause problems. He's the son of a chieftain who just made allegiance with us. They're paying taxes. They're doing this. You have to go into that village and take that boy, take that young man who raped that poor village girl and punish him. And the discussion. There's nothing else to talk about. It's your job now to build the waterways, the water system, the schools, and the infrastructure of the country now. It's your turn to fuck them. Show us what you're made of. Do your worst. And if you don't, then just know for sure this is the sunnah of the people who came before you. They talk about justice. They talk about equality. They talk about human rights. They talk about civilian casualties. And they turn around and they become the evil monsters that they claim to hate. And one of the reasons behind this is, is that a person has to hate evil for evil. You can't hate evil because of what or who is performing or perpetrating the evil. And that's how most human beings are. They really don't hate evil. But they just hate the evil being done to them. I mean, sad and un, un, uh, uncomfortable truths that we have to speak about in America. Arab Americans, Muslim or Christian, whatever they are, they talk about discrimination against Arabs. They're discriminating against us. This president is a racist. Trump's a racist. They banned the Muslims or the Arabs from these countries. Oh, Arab Americans. All right, tell you, are you against racism and prejudice? Or are you against it happening to you? Because when you have your own locations, mosques, restaurants, shopping centers, whatever. They, how do you treat people who aren't Arab? How do you look down upon them when a black person walks into the door of your restaurant? What face do you make? A Muslim in a masjid, the house of Allah. How do you look at him when he walks into an Arab masjid? Do you welcome him? We all know the answers. So a person isn't against prejudice. They're not against prejudice. Those, those Arab Americans, they're not against it. They're not against the evil. But they're only against it happening to them. And the same applies to anybody else. Black, white, yellow, green, etc. People aren't against the shar, but they're against the shar happening to them. And when they have the upper hand and they're in control, they turn around and do the shar, the evil, to other humans. And that's a big problem. And we will be in this perpetual cycle of the dog chasing his tail. As long as we selectively like and dislike. We are against the principle. Anyone who treats another human being like this, we're against it. Versus we're only going to speak out against it when it's happening to our race, our religion. And there are many other examples of this. The unfortunate, the unfortunate is an understatement. The unbelievable, unreal atrocities that are taking place to our Muslim brothers and sisters in Palestine and have been taking place for all of these years. Once again, and not to pick on the Arab Americans, but we're trying to make real life examples, that's all. Look, protest, rallies, speaking up against oppression, against wrong, so on and so forth, calling everyone to protest, to speak out, to wear this flag, to paint your face like this, etc. But how many Arab Americans were speaking out against Black Lives, La Black Lives Matter movement a few years back, a few summers back, in which every other day there was another black person getting shot, getting gunned down in the street, shot with a shotgun, close range, walking down the street, running down the street, bursting to her apartment, just shooting people just for the fun of it. It was a sport. How many Arab Americans spoke out against it? 
How many Arab Americans protested? How many Arab Americans said, hey, 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 wait, wait a second. Something's seriously wrong now. The guy was holding a cell phone and he was shot 12 times. Maybe a few, perhaps. But we all know the reality is that the vast majority, 99% of them didn't care. They didn't care because it didn't bother them. They're black people. They're drug dealers and criminals anyway. This is what they deserve. Many people who don't say these words, that's how they feel in their hearts. It's known. But now you turn the table, Arabs are being killed and slaughtered unjustly. That's a different story now. We stand up for our cause. And, and you have to as well. Did you get the point? So it's extremely unfortunate. So we all have to reflect and ponder on this part of the hadith. When Allah Ta'ala mustakhlifukum fiha fayanduru kayfa ta'maloon. That Allah Azawajal is giving you succession. You will have the turn next. And he will look towards how you will behave. Wallahu ta'ala alam. Wa an anasin radiyallahu anhu anna nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala Allahumma la aisha illa aisha al-akhirati mutafakur alayhi. Anas radiyallahu anhu narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said Oh Allah, there is no living except for the living in the afterworld. And hadith is agreed upon. There is no true life except for the life in the hereafter. وعنه عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أنه قال يتبع الميت ثلاثة أهله وماله وعمله فيرجع اثنان ويبقى واحد يرجع أهله وماله ويبقى عمله متفق عليه. أنس رضي الله عنه also narrated that the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم said three things follow the deceased: his family, his wealth, and his deeds. Two of the three will return; only one will remain. His family, wife, children, crying, they'll go back. They'll leave the graveyard. His wealth will leave the graveyard. Scholars of Islam discuss how a person's wealth follows the deceased. What's meant by that? Back in the day, was a person's money taken to the graveyard? The horses, camels, donkeys, and mules that the people rode upon? His wealth a person's slaves and servants following the master, deceased master or mistress to the graveyard, a person's wealth, right? All of that is going to go. And in the modern times, people oftentimes discuss the will or the estate or the legal paperwork and the hearse and the limo towards the graveyard, right? So that's a manifestation of a person's wealth following him. And the only thing that remains with you are your deeds. Allah must die. Allah must die. A narration that states that the deeds will speak to the dead person in the grave. And it will say to him, In kuntu la'ana ahwan thalathati alayk. Obi hadal ma'ana. Versions of this narration mentioned by Ibn Rajab. That the deeds will speak to the deceased person in the grave and they will say, indeed, I was the most insignificant of your three friends. I was the least favorite of, of, of your buddies. Ahwan, I was the lowest of them. That's, that's, that's beyond deep. You think about that. A man who has many sons and he has a son who's the runt of the litter. The son is a little frail, skinny, thick, you know, Bottle cap glasses, nerdy, awkward, inept, right? Not an athlete, not handsome, not a ladies' man. You know, the, the, the older sons bully him, look down upon him, beat him up, make him cry at school to take his lunch money, his milk money, and so on and so forth. He, he's not a, you know, a popular, strong son. He doesn't look like he's going to inherit the throne. He doesn't look like he's going to inherit the family business, right? And the father ignores this runty son. He ignores him. And, you know, he pays all of the attention and the focus, the time and the energy on the strong sons, the healthy sons, the sons that look just like him, the sons with the muscles, the sons with the looks, the sons that are the ladies' men, get the girls, makes the father happy and proud, the sons that are, you know, bullies and tyrants of others. The father says, my sons are strong. Look at them. And little does he know, this son is going to die from a disease. This son is going to have a violent death because he was a violent bully. This person is going to such and such. This person is going to be a drunkard, a drug addict, etc., etc., etc. 
and the son that is going to be the true heir of the throne, the one to inherit the throne, the one that's going to further his father's business and take his father's business to new heights is going to be the nerdy, runty son. And when the father grows old and sick and he becomes on his deathbed, he gets cancer, lung cancer, throat cancer, right? Diabetes, colon cancer. He'll want his son to visit him. How you doing, son? I've heard so much about you, mashallah. You know, I'm so proud of you, blah, blah. I, I, I never think that you could do it, but at the same time, I knew you could do it. Lying to him. Of course, the son is going to say, get out of here. You never believed in me. You never thought I was going to do anything. You never thought I was going to go anywhere. And when it's time for him to die, he's going to want to be close to that son. And as if the son would say to him, Father, I forgive you. I love you. But let's not forget, I was the least of your favorite sons. I was the one that got the, the smallest slice of your time and attention and love. Just think about that worldly parable. Think about that now. Think about your own life. A girl, a daughter, the daughter that's not the most beautiful daughter, that doesn't look like just like the mother, right? How the mom ignores her and mistreats her and looks down upon her. It's interesting. وعنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يؤتى بأنعم أهل الدنيا من أهل النار يوم القيامه فيصبغ في النار صبغة ثم يقال يا بنادم هل رأيت خيرا قط هل مر بك نعيم قط فيقول لا والله يا رب ويتبع شد الناس بؤسا في الدنيا من أهل الجنة فيسبق صبغة في الجنة فيقال له يا ابن آدم هل رأيت بؤسا قط هل مر بك شدة قط فيقول لا والله ما مر بي بؤس قط ولا رأيت شدة قط رأه مسلم The last hadith that we mention in this class is also narrated by Anas that on the day of judgment the most luxurious man will be brought forward and he will be dipped into the fire for a short period of time and then taken out and asked, O son of Adam, have you ever seen any good? Have you ever witnessed goodness or luxury? Have you ever passed by any goodness or luxury? Of course not, O Allah. Not once. And the poorest person in this world will be brought forward who, who's from among the people of Jannah, decreed to be from the people of Jannah, he will be placed inside of Jannah for a short period of time. Uh, and Allah will ask him, O son of Adam, have you ever seen any hardship? Have you ever seen any difficulty? Have you ever seen poverty? Stress? He will say, of course not. No, Allah. I've never seen anything. Oh my Lord. And this hadith is collected by Muslim and it is beyond profound. Beyond profound. Not a rich man, but the richest man in history. This will take place, huh? And he'll forget all of his riches, all of his wealth, just like that. Just like you'll forget all your poverty and problems, just like that. Wala hawla wala quwata illa billah. Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. Wa sallallahu sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasulihi nabina wa imamina Muhammad.